here. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone who is uh, in uh, Moscow time zone, and good afternoon to our colleagues and friends in the region. We are happy to uh, start this uh, next uh, event within the framework of uh, SN Academic Days in Gimur University. And this time we have a very interesting speaker and presenter, uh, Pakwahit Supriyadi, uh, who served as uh, ambassador to Moscow and has left us not just uh, for uh, not, not just long ago. And uh, we are happy to reconnect and to, uh, we are happy that uh, Pak Supriyadi used uh, the, the past months uh, with a great benefit because he has just published a very interesting book about diplomacy. And the title is intriguing. Uh, and Pak Wahid, I hope uh, you will explain why you have opted for this, uh, for this title. Unfortunately, I mean, I'm, unfortunately for me, who is not an Indonesian speaker, uh, the book uh, it exists so far only in the Indonesian language, uh, but we hope for, uh, well, for translations uh, to appear. And I think that uh, sometime uh, from now on, we will be able to enjoy reading it in, in other languages. So uh, the audience today is really wide. Uh, I mean, the, those who registered and uh, people who have voiced their interest uh, in, uh, in the book and in the discussion around it represent Taiwan, Kyrgyz Republic, uh, the Philippines, Vietnam, South Africa, Brazil, Brunei, Jerusalem, Indonesia, of course, Russia, um, and uh, I think even probably some other countries which I cannot uh, figure out right in the, in the moment from the list. Of course, not everyone has managed to join, uh, but for this uh, purpose, so we have collected uh, several questions beforehand and we will raise them in the discussion. And of course, there will be a recording place on the uh, uh, ASEAN Center uh, website for those who would like to, uh, to reiterate and to, uh, to have uh, a look at our today's discussion. We are happy to welcome colleagues from um, Institute of Asian and African Studies and Moscow State University, from the Diplomatic Academy, from the uh, People's Friendship uh, University, and we are very grateful that you are here today with us. And it, it's good to to reconnect and to see you, uh, unfortunately in Zoom, but hopefully sometime ahead we will uh, we will be able to meet in person. So, uh, without much further ado, let me pass the floor to Dr. Viktor Sumsky, the ASEAN Center Director, who will uh, say a couple of uh, introductory remarks. And then we will have uh, Pak Wahid's presentation and afterwards Q&A session. If you wish to raise uh, well, a question or have a comment, please send a message to, to the chat and uh, I will recognize your uh, intention to, to comment on something. Uh, Dr. Viktor, please, a couple of words in the beginning and then we will move to the presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Ekaterina. When you were saying that today we are reconnecting with somebody who we know, uh, let me just confirm that this is exactly what it is and that today we are uh, hosting a very dear and a very special friend. Uh, many of you who are joining today's session had a chance to listen to his, his lectures and to enjoy interacting with him personally and informally at Ngimo at the High School of Economics at People's Friendship University. The name just, th this is just a very short list of educational and research institutions that uh, our guest had a chance to visit during his four years in Russia. Uh, and even in the year of the pandemic, we here at Ngimo uh, had no less than three personal encounters with him, which I think is an achievement of sorts. The last one was in June 2020, when uh, he paid a farewell, uh, 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 farewell call to Mgimo Rector, Professor Anatoly Turkunov. So this is no other than His Excellency Ambassador uh, Mohamed Wahid Supriyadi, a diplomat who has distinguished career spanned uh, almost uh, 45 years and included such high postings as that of Indonesia's Consul General in Melbourne, Australia, Ambassador of Indonesia uh, to the United Arab Emirates, and then of course from 2016 to 2020 to the Russian Federation. One way to quickly uh, describe uh, 
how uh, extensive and diversified were uh, his links to Russia uh, is to look at the list of his various awards. And I will start with, uh, uh, I think, a rare dis distinction of being included to the Indonesian version of the Guinness Book of Records. Uh, this is the Muri Award, which was uh, given to him for successfully organizing a string of Indonesian cultural festivals here in Russia. Uh, uh, other signs of his dedication to the development of Indonesia-Russia relations and to the fact that uh, this has not gone unnoticed in our country is uh, the title of a honorary professor for international relations by Tomsk State University. Uh, I wonder if there is somebody in our today's audience representing Tomsk. Then, of course, uh, the cultural breakthrough of the year award by the Russian Asian Union of Industrialists and Entrepreneurs in December 2019, and the Medal of Muslims of Russia for Services by the Mufti Council of Russia, July 2020. I think uh, this list uh, tells a lot about the different directions and the different paths uh, our guest has uh, had been walking in Russia while he was posted here. And, and this alone is a sign of a, very, uh, of a very good and sophisticated diplomat. Now, uh, how do we address our guest? I think uh, Dr. Ekaterina already had shown us the way by calling him Pak Wahid. <laughs> uh, you know, it is uh, a very nice way the Indonesians have to combine in the address of a person a touch of genuine respect because Bapak is an abbreviation for the father. The, the traditional address to a, to, to, a, to a distinguished male counterpart. But it is also an abbreviated version of Bapak, Pak, which indicates that you would like to be a little closer, a little less formal than we, uh, we normally should be in, in our social interaction and, and insert an element of friendliness. So Pak Wahid, thank you very much for uh, finding time for today's uh, encounter with your old friends in, in Russia. Uh, I'm, I'm giving back the floor to Ekaterina, who I think will, will give the floor to you. Indeed. So, Pak Wahid, please, we would like to uh, listen to your comments and probably the most juicy um, elements of what you have in your book. So everyone got more intrigued and um, would like to learn Indonesian to read it afterwards. Uh, thank you, uh, Pak Sumski. I always call him Pak Sumski because, uh, you know, this is reflecting the closeness of our relation and besides the fact that uh, Pasinski uh, speak uh, Indonesian quite well. And uh, Dr. Katarina, uh, thank you very much uh, for moderating uh, this uh, webinar today. And it's my great honor to be the guest of uh, ASEAN Academic Days. So it's, you, you are right, we are like reconnecting uh, Russia. And I will not be away from Russia because I'm representing also now uh, officially uh, representative of a business association of Russian Business Association, and uh, I also uh, uh, advise some companies who are interested in doing business uh, with Russia. So I think this is uh, just uh, started. You now after I organized four times uh, festival, the awareness between the two nations has just to just start to flourish. You know, uh, it's still a long way to go. And actually, uh, I met uh, uh, Jose. Tafares, my successor, uh, twice already, and he promised to uh, continue what I have done. And I brought books to Pa Sumsky and uh, Pa Victor. Uh, unfortunately, I, uh, I haven't, I cannot give it to you because it's in Bahasa Indonesia. But my daughters, two daughters, are uh, start translating into English. So one, the English version uh, complete, I will send to you. Um, actually. Uh, I wrote this uh, only in two and a half months and many people could not believe it. I said, 
Uh, well, first, uh, there is always uh, opportunity uh, during the crisis, you know, like in the pandemic uh, uh, years or months that we just undergone. And uh, I have much more time to write. So uh, thanks to COVID that uh, I could finish my book within uh, two and a half months. And also uh, thanks to Google, because the most difficult thing in writing is to find the, uh, the, uh, the database. You know? I, I remember an event like in Australia a long time ago, but usually when I had uh, a big event, I also uh, wrote a press release and at least it was published by some Indonesian media. So it made me much easier to uh, get the database. Uh, <clears throat> my book uh, actually uh, a bit unusual uh, because many uh, uh, friends um, uh, in Indonesia, ambassadors, uh, at least there are several who wrote a book, but uh, in more serious way. So uh, I took from the different angles. So I wrote, and maybe we can translate it into uh, light and entertaining diplomacy. So literally, uh, lucu means funny, you know, but maybe funny is not the correct word, like entertaining diplomacy, uh, true story. So I can divide these uh, books in uh, three categories. You know, uh, Number one is the importance of cultural diplomacy. I was posted in three times, which culturally very different. You know. Australia is a egalitarian and liberal democracy. Uh, they call it matchship. So it's very common uh, for Australian to call by first name. Yeah. Even, even uh, journalists call the minister using uh, first name. Uh, John Howard, they call it John. You know. And uh, in, in Australia, dinner, to be invited for dinner or lunch is a great honor. Yeah. We can debate in, during the dinner. We can fight during the dinner. But that's the way they, they, they do. Uh, so once, for example, I was a bit uh, uneasy with uh, the right winger journalists who always think that, you know, like Arab Islam is Arab, Arab is terrorist. So very, very uh, negative uh, portrayal of Islam. Uh, of course, Indonesia, because we are the biggest Muslim country in the world. Uh, he wrote uh, an editorial uh, at, uh, through Herod Sun, and then also uh, he's one of the uh, resources uh, during a debate, uh, a very uh, high rating uh, program in Australia called Good Morning Australia. So then I called him and uh, for, for lunch and he agreed. And we, we were fighting for three times and then the four times uh, I said very brandly, you know, uh, look, uh, Andrew, uh, this is between you and me, forget about diplomatic language. You know? so first, uh, you have to make a difference between is Islam as teaching and Arab as culture or nation. Not everything from Arab is Islamic. And then number two, you know, the first international law in terms of war is Islamic war, Islamic law. You know, you cannot kill people who surrender. Uh, you have to protect women and children, and you have to protect places of worship. So what the Taliban did is not Islamic. And then he, you know, he, he started to uh, agree with me. And then the next day, he wrote a, a bit positive about Indonesia. So, so this is the way we have to deal with with the Islam and. And the Australian journalists and academics are very critical. They are not only critical uh, to uh, foreign countries, but also to their own government. Uh, and this is not easy for uh, the one who is posted as information officer. Sometimes we have become the spokesperson of the embassy or the Council general. And some are already anti-Indonesia. Whatever we say, they are always anti-Indonesia. They don't like Indonesia, you know? especially some uh, journalists uh, who remember the the case of Balipo 5. Now they, what, what we did is always wrong. So this is the, the challenges in, uh, in, in, in Australia. Then I moved to Abu Dhabi, uh, to, culture, to United Arab Emirates. This is totally a different uh, culture, you know. For the first two months, I was frustrated, yeah, because uh, in my mind, I was still filled in with, uh, you know, Australian mindset. So one day I invited uh, a director general for information for lunch, and he said, "Inshallah, you know, Inshallah, Pak pa Sumsi, yeah. So Inshallah in, in in the Arab word means if God permit, you know. So if I don't come in, God doesn't permit me to come. <laughs> so they even blame the God. <laughs> so I invited for lunch. I can't remember the day, uh, twelve thirty, and then 
you know, in, a, in general practice, uh, I should be ready in the restaurant at 12.15. Until 12.30, he didn't so on. And then, um, and then one o'clock, I tried to call him, switch off. So I was having lunch with my staff. And then, uh, you know, one day uh, I met him in a, a cocktail. Once he saw me, he just came to me and grabbed me uh, uh, and then kissed me three times. You know. So Arab never say apology, but the way they express the approach is through, you know, hugging people and kissing three times. You know. And then I forget my anger when, when, <laughs> they, when he already grabbed me and, uh, you know, kissed me three times. Uh, also, on, uh, but, but the, after the, the three, two months you know, of frustration, and then I asked uh, my friend who was educated in uh, Madrasa, but also I read some books about uh, United Arab Emirates. You know, uh, Indian, I always feel like at home, you know. Uh, when they invited us and we come, we are treated like a king. But on the other way around, if we invite him, he may not come, you know. You know but, but once he come, he, he noted, especially when an event was organized by uh, uh, Sheikh or by ministers, you know. Sheikh is, has very high rank in the uh, United Arab Emirates, even so the position is a bit higher than, than the minister. So once they trusted, they're very good. They give us whatever we like, you know. So and then this makes me uh, my job much much easier when I was in United Arab Emirates. And then suddenly I was posted in Russia. I've never been in Russia except one in Vladivostok during the uh, APEC summit uh, 2012, you know. But Vladivostok was a small town at the time. Uh, just started to be developed. And uh, like many Indonesian, uh, our reference about Russia is the Hollywood movies, you know. So uh, Russia you know, is stereotyped you know, as people who cannot smile, you know, cold bloody, you know, uh, something like that. So the image is not very good, to be honest. Uh, but then I feel I, I believe that, you know, every nation, they have their own wisdom. So before I came to Russia, I read a book, uh, several books, and one that impressed me a lot is a book written by Martin Sixsmith, uh, like 1,000 Years of White East, if I'm not mistaken. It's a very good book, comprehensive, starting from Rurik the Rus, you know, 1,000 years ago, until the early uh, Putin government. Uh, it's not only, uh, well, of course, some few from, you know, from Western perspective, but many uh, tell the facts about the history of, 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 of Russia. So I concluded that, you know, Russians are very proud of their culture and their history, you know, despite the fact that uh, they experienced very difficult times uh, during the communist uh, era. So when I uh, arrived, <coughs> In, uh, in Moscow, uh, I think 1st of April uh, 2016. And then the following day, I asked uh, my driver to go to Kremlin because everybody wants to go to Kremlin. You know. And then suddenly I saw, uh, you know, people queuing. You know. I asked my uh, driver, what are they doing? Or oh, they're queuing for the museum. I said, what? You know, because nobody go to museum in Indonesia. <laughs> and and uh, it turned out that the Russian, uh, I mean, to teach their children, you know, to understand the history, the culture, they can go to a museum. And I prove it, you know, I went to a museum next to the embassy, uh, it's basically a paintings museum. And then I followed the number, you know, uh, through interpretation. And then suddenly I recovered what I read about uh, Russia. You know, it's not easy to memorize. Uh, Russian uh, names and words, you know, it's so difficult for, for Indonesian. Uh, and then uh, I also discovered that actually Russia is a huge and multicultural society, which not many people understand, you know. Russia has 120 uh, ethnic groups or nationalities with different languages. And not many people in Indonesia know that actually the biggest Muslim population in Europe it's probably in Russia, you know, some say 20 to 24 uh, million uh, 
uh, Muslim in, in Russia. And, and this is something that, you know, that uh, not many people understand that uh, religion uh, uh, in, in Russia is respected. And uh, actually, the fastest growing religion in, in Russia is, is Muslim. You know? I, I was told by Mufti that uh, there are around 8,000 uh, mosques in Russia. And every time I go to uh, provincial governments, if they have mosques, I, could, I went to the mosque. And uh, they feel they are free to practice their religion, even during the Idul Fitr or Idul Atta. You know, the police have blocked some routes you know, to protect uh, the Muslim to do the prayer. So this is not much different from, from Indonesia. And also, uh, what I was impressed is that, you know, the old generation, they still have the memory uh, of Sukarno. Yeah. Every time uh, I went to uh, places where Sukarno visited in the past, like in Sochi, uh, Yekaterinburg and so on. And the governor always said that, you know, Sukarno went here. Uh, and then he told, told me about, you know, what was he doing and so on. Uh, that's why I put one, uh, uh, one uh, piece of the legacy of Sukarno, you know. Uh, I was so surprised when uh, I went to Dagestan and uh, I went to Durban, the uh, old city, and where Islam came to Russia just 10 years after the demise of Prophet Muhammad. And I met the, uh, the Imam and the Imam uh, grabbed me and hugged me and, and he said, you are the first Indonesian ambassador uh, coming to uh, Dagestan. And then I went to Makhatskala, the capital. And can you believe it? I met two boys, yeah, 10 and 12 years old. Their names are Sukarno bin Kamilovich and the, the brother, the elder brother, Sukarno bin Mogamedovich. You know? I said, how come? If people with something like 80 years old, I think it's, it makes sense you know, that you know, they, for the, uh, uh, their, their uh, you know, adorance about Sukarno. But this is a boys of two, 10 and 12 years. It, it turned out that, that uh, their grand-grandfather uh, was, the one who admired Sukarno. That was in 1961 when Sukarno was invited by Khrushchev for a mi international meeting. And then uh, during the uh, midday, uh, that happened to be on Friday, uh, Sukarno resisted, asked permission from Khrushchev uh, to go out to do the prayer. Although we know actually as Muslim, as travelers, we can do the prayer later on, but Sukarno is an artist. You know? He would like to show off. You know? He would like to say that I come from the biggest Muslim country in the world. And uh, to his surprise, uh, Khrushchev, uh, you know, gave permission to Sukarno to do the prayer. And for the admiration uh, of, of Sukarno, uh, Musa, in this name, uh, the name is Musa. He representing like, uh, you know, uh, Farmers Association. And then 162, uh, his son was born and was given the name of Sukarno bin Musa. So it, it's very interesting story. I could not believe it that, you know, uh, Sukarno still, at least from the elder generation, they have the name. Uh, and the second part uh, of my book is really, uh, I would like to give a motivation, you know, uh, especially for those who joined the foreign services coming from non-mainstream department. You know, my background is English literature. You know? I'm not from the uh, international relation as most of the diplomat come from. You know? But uh, I could become twice ambassadors and one consul general. You know? So everybody can. But also I would like to give a motivation especially for people in the remote areas. You know, I was born and grown up in real remote areas in the uh, regency of Kabumen. Uh, so from my uh, village to uh, the capital of the regency, it's about 20 kilometers. There was no electricity at the time, you know, the road was not good, you know. Uh, I was even, at, during my time, the one who owned uh, radio, only a few people, yeah. So I have plenty of time because I don't have farm, 
my uh, father was a teacher at elementary school. So I listened to radio. Uh, and at that time, the national radio uh, opened only from 6 to 8. And then 8 to 10, local radio. And then between 10 to 12, there is no national radios. So in that vacuum, is filled in by Voice of America, BBC, and Radio Australia. Uh, the strongest signal is Radio Australia. So I, watch, I, I listen to Radio Australia, and then I send letter to Radio Australia, and they give, us, they give me a, a package of uh, books. Uh, in, uh, it's like a teaching, uh, teaching materials for English, and I didn't know about English at the time because I was still at the elementary school. Later on, when I joined the junior high school, I, start, uh, I started studying uh, English. Uh, and, and I was given also the photos of the, uh, 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 the broadcasters. And what happened, in 20 years later, I was interviewed by those broadcasters, the one who I admire you know, a lot. You know. So sometimes we don't know what happened. You know. uh, it's more or less by accident and luck. And then uh, the third part of my books is about lights and funny stories. And it happened because this is based on uh, true stories. Uh, for example, when uh, I was in uh, Australia, I had a holiday at Port Macquarie. This is uh, a border between New South and Queensland. And then one day before uh, I finished my holiday, I complete, before I completed my holiday, I went around to the uh, outer suburb and I saw a couple of old men uh, who was fishing, and then uh, and then he, then they asked me uh, if uh, if I could join. I said I don't have the fishing line. No, you just come. And then suddenly he saw my car uh, number plate because my car number plate is DC forty three and something. Forty three means Indonesia. Yeah. And then he asked me, "Are you from Washington?" No, I said, "No, no. Why? Why your plate name is DC? No. Oh, this is." stand for diplomatic corps. <laughs> and then he asked, they asked me to uh, come to uh, their home for dinner and he was so excited. And later he gave me a piece of like a, a press skin. It's like certificate of land in, in England, uh, the Ancestor 1824, 1825. So uh, it, it does, it's, it's not valid anymore, but uh, that was, so surprised uh, for me because I said, this is very uh, historical for you. No, I, I give it to you because I like it. And then uh, my other experience also in Canberra. Uh, you know, many Asian uh, people, you know, especially I think Vietnamese also, Indonesian people also, uh, they like making soup, but the soup is very special. Uh, the soup, one of the ingredients is the head, you know, the headfish. Uh, fish head, you know, fish head of uh, the most uh, delicious one is snapper. You know. And, you know, it was very cheap at the time in, in, in Canberra because uh, they don't think that uh, human beings eat uh, fish, uh, fish head. And my friend uh, always make, uh, you know, fish head soup almost every week. Uh, it was only 50 cents, you know, per kilo at the time. But suddenly when when I asked my wife to do the cooking by, the, by, by myself and uh, we went to the same uh, uh, supermarket and suddenly the price of the fish uh, had uh, increasing by 100% and suddenly becoming uh, one dollar you know so they realized that the Asian people they like uh, fish head you know? <laughs> so uh, this is some of the stories that I experienced in Canberra and then in, in Emirates, uh, you know, uh, I was invited by uh, one of the chef uh, to watch the camel racing. Yeah. Uh, I was, you know, uh, a bit, uh, you know, you know like, like unbelievable. You know? I, I can't believe that, uh, you know, during the race, I saw a camel. And then behind the camel is the Alexis uh, or Land Cruiser. So I start asking with who who did the racing, the camel on the Lexus. I could not see because it was uh, a bit distant. But then when they close, 
I realized that, you know, uh, actually the jockey of the camel is robot. So one in the Land Cruiser driver and the other one is the controller. So uh, it's not, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, what is the, the arts of this racing actually? But since, you know, I would like to know the uh, Seh and it turned out that he was the chairman of Emirate, Emirate Heritage Club the one who oversee all the setters in in uh, in United Arab Emirates in Abu Dhabi so so I was the only ambassador coming so he was happy and then he asked me to present the uh, trophy and then what happened when I wrote a letter to him asking the permission to use the Abu Dhabi setter and then the CEO called me ambassador could you come to my office you know say agree everything you want so just mention it and you will get it. So then uh, the CEO uh, asked me uh, how many artists we have 24, 24 of enough, you know, and then all the Abu Dhabi, including the uh, sound system, the security, so all provided by us. Uh, while other ambassadors ask the same thing and they ask only for renting of the Abu Dhabi, the rest they have to pay. So, so that's why you know uh, as i mentioned in the beginning uh, the 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 Arab people they're very appreciative if they invite us and we come and then to my surprise also i was invited you know, in the middle of the desert there was a belly dance you know you know our emirate are very uh, conservative you know in, in dressing you know. the ladies they use uh, abaya you know. But in the middle of the desert, there is a belly dance. So, so I could not believe it, but it happened. Uh, for the Russian, uh, I mentioned already about you know, the family queen for the museum. But I realized also that there are some Asian values within the Russian. So one day I asked my uh, staff, Marina, uh, and I know that she just gave a birth. And then her husband also working. So I said, I asked Marina, uh, how is your son? You know, because all of you are working. Oh, with my, with my grandma at the, at the dacha. Oh, is it so? Oh, yes, that's very common in, in Russia. You know, I can't believe it because you know, in Western society, uh, I don't think there is one grandfather, grandmother or grandfather you know, who, who is taking care of the grandchildren. But this happened. And then one day my uh, driver uh, uh, came to me uh, and then asked my secretary if he could see me. I said, oh, of course. He, he, he saw me every day. And he said, why? And then he started, you know, a bit like crying, you know, and not really crying, but... Uh, uh, he was, he looked very sad. And I said, what happened? And then he said, Ambassador, I would like to resign. I said, you didn't like me? No, Ambassador, I was, I've been working uh, within the embassy for, you know, dozens of years and I like it because the Indonesian treat me like family. And, or maybe your salary is not, no, not my, not, not about the salary. And then the problem, uh, my father was seriously ill and I have to take care of my father. So you, you see, this couldn't happen in Western society, you know. The son will better send him to the nursery home, you know, instead of taking him. And this happened in Russia. So actually within the Russian people, there are some uh, Asian values in there. And if you look at the area, I think majority of the area uh, belong to the Asian uh, continents. And one also that uh, I was uh, a bit you know, awkward when I visited Nizhny Novgorod. I read a book by Martin Sexsmith that, you know, uh, there was a Kif uh, monastery uh, in Novgorod and uh, the, the monks there wrote uh, prayer, the, pray, uh, the preacher, the preacher wrote the uh, uh, chronicles upon the history of the Russia. But at the time, I could not make the difference between Novgorod and Nizhny Novgorod. So I went to Nizhny Novgorod uh, bearing in mind that I'm going to look at the uh, cave monastery. So I asked the protocol and he was a bit puzzled, you know, about, about the cave monastery because there is no cave monastery. 
Instead, he brought me to a monastery. So when I came back to my office, I was I asked my staff, and I just realized that I visited in the wrong place. You no, know? I thought that was Novgorod, the uh, like the, the old uh, you know uh, capital. But uh, that's where the uh, history of uh, Russia was written. So that's all. That's basically what uh, I wrote about uh, my book, and uh, I uh, wrote it in very uh, light way. And I'm surprised that actually. Uh, you know, many people ordered the book from the publisher because there's not in the uh, bookstore at the moment. Uh, but uh, the response very high, uh, at least to uh, universities already uh, launched the books. And then there's another university. And uh, today, uh, Tempo Magazine uh, put uh, my name there. Uh, and with my photo uh, bringing the, the book. So, uh, thank you very much, Sumki, uh, uh, Dr. Ekaterina, so for giving me this opportunity to promote my book. Although, uh, I, I don't know whether Pak Sumki will translate into Russian because it's more than 300 pages. <laughs> but, but my daughters uh, told me uh, they start two daughters. Uh, they were grown up in Australia, they start uh, translating my book. So, hopefully, when the English version was uh, published, I will send you at least some for the library of MGMO. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pak Wahid. And uh, we are happy to have uh, two Pak Victors with us. And um, I would like to uh, give a floor for a short comment or reflection to uh, Pak Victor Alexandrovich Pogadai. Probably he could react. Uh, Moreover, he participated in another event related uh, to your world book and writings uh, not so long ago. And we have a nice list of uh, very interesting questions from the students and younger professionals afterwards. Thank you. Pak Victor Alexander. Включите микрофон, Виктор Александрович. So, the <clears throat> <laughs> Good morning to, to everybody. I'm very glad uh, to see uh, Vahid's uh, wanted to say Sikalilagi once again, <laughs> and uh, all other participants in uh, this uh, event. Uh, so, this is uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Vahid with a very interesting book because I had the opportunity to uh, look it through. And uh, it, it is a very, really very, very, very interesting. And I hope maybe uh, one, one time, so someday, uh, somebody will translate it into, <laughs> into Russian and in you know, order everybody could uh, enjoy uh, <coughs> the remembrance of Pavahit. Um, yeah, because it's uh, always interesting uh, for, the, for the diplomats um, to, to go to some other countries uh, to to know uh, the culture of the country and sometimes uh, even uh, we uh, who are living in the in Russia for instance in this country we uh, don't pay attention much attention to <laughs> what is happening around us and uh, you know, people uh, diplomats from other countries who came uh, to Russia so so they have uh, they uh, maybe uh, see more than we ourselves, for, for instance, in Moscow, yeah? And when I read in this book that uh, he paid attention that if you see in Moscow, for instance, a long queue, that means there is museum there or some exhibition. <laughs> we just go, go past and don't pay attention to it. And, and he pay, paid attention to it um, uh, because uh, it was very interesting for him. And in uh, in a um, yeah, bigger, bigger scale, uh, uh, that, that means that uh, Russians are very fond of uh, uh, us, you know, for instance, uh, like this, yeah? And uh, it was very interesting to, to read in the book uh, about uh, the impression, not only about Moscow, but about uh, some other countries or uh, some other cities uh, in, uh, in Russia, because Pak uh, uh, traveled a lot in uh, about Russia and uh, <clears throat> because of this, uh, the relationship uh, with the uh, region between Indonesia and uh, regions in uh, Russia also uh, became very um, uh, profound. 
Uh, just imagine two years ago, I, I went to Aceh, to Bandar Aceh, and to my amazement, I met several girls from Tatarstan who mm. were there in the uh, cultural group. So uh, the relationship not only between Moscow and Jakarta, but also between region, uh, for instance, uh, uh, <clears throat> Tatarstan and, uh, uh, and uh, this um, Aceh, they, they came uh, to uh, chair with uh, some performances, you know, and uh, it is uh, became po po possible. It uh, became possible <coughs> because of the uh, active uh, work of uh, uh, Vahid, uh, and uh, also I, I think that uh, this book is uh, very interesting uh, for for the Indonesians uh, themselves, uh, of course. Uh, because uh, they are prepared now <laughs> what, what is expecting them uh, in Russia when they will come uh, as a tourist and uh, we know that uh, nowadays it's, it, beca it, it became <laughs> easier because uh, they can uh, apply for visa through internet easily and uh, I think after this uh, pandemic uh, finished uh, so they, they will come to Russia with holding uh, his books in, in their hands. <laughs> uh, also, it's uh, very important uh, for Indonesian also because uh, <clears throat> uh, this, uh, there are two uh, aspects of the book. First, it's about the country where Wahid was, stay, was posting. And the second, because this uh, book uh, uh, reflects also the activity of uh, 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 embassy and uh, uh, ambassador himself. You know, sometimes people say, "Oh, this is this is those diplomats. They just have so, such a nice life. They go just abroad and uh, you know enjoy themselves like, like this." You know, but uh, when we uh, uh, <laughs> read this book, so we see that it is not so uh, easy. Yeah, I mean, because uh, um, Pak Wahid was. Uh, uh, working hard here, and uh, so so the people will say will uh, will understand that uh, uh, they don't waste. Uh, I mean, uh, money just just for nothing, yeah. Because it's it's very very important uh, for the relationship between two countries, you know, and uh, not not only in the cultural sphere, of course, but uh, mostly in. Uh, economic and trade and so on and so on. So, uh, the, so uh, let me uh, <coughs> congratulate again uh, Pak Wahid uh, with this uh, very interesting <laughs> book and uh, I hope uh, that later maybe really um, uh, Russians also will, will uh, know this uh, book uh, quite well. Yeah. So this, uh, I, uh, I just, I, I envy the Indonesians <laughs> who could, <laughs> could do this book, you know. Yeah, thank you very much, yeah. Okay, thank you, Pak Victor. Thank you, uh, Pak Victor, for your nice and very lively uh, comment on that. And uh, we have uh, not least entertaining questions. Um, some of them relate to the real life, some of them relate to the policy issues. Uh, but let me, uh, first of all, uh, give the screen to Mr. Danilo Simonenko from Institute of Asian and African Studies. Uh, he has a very straightforward question. Danilo, if you could uh, Please unmute uh, your mic and ask the question to Pak Wahid. Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you, Pak Wahid, for the presentation. It was really great, and I uh, hope I will have a chance to read your book in English. So, uh, to my question, like, uh, you know, uh, it looks like in the Ministry of the Foreign Affairs, all the decisions are taken by some uh, top officials, ministers, and uh, uh, it looks like all the other people just have to do what they're told to do. Uh, is it really true or does it just uh, looks like that? And uh, are there any opportunities for, uh, for you like to take some, to make some decisions like independently and uh, to be uh, well uh, creative in a way maybe before you become an ambassador or maybe a minister? Thank you. Well, that's a very, very serious question. <laughs> well, actually, the foreign policy maker is, is in the head of the state himself. Yeah. Uh, so every country, they have their own uh, policy, but uh, the policy, uh, the foreign policy is not static. It, it will be developing. So, and, and very much sometimes depend on the style of 
of the leader. Uh, the modern history is, is very, very dif different from the previous one, the classical uh, uh, diplomacy, like, you know, in, in the, the 17th century, uh, Harry Wharton said that uh, an ambassador is an honest gentleman sent to lie abroad for the good of his country, you know. But you cannot do that today because everything is open, you know. Uh, and that's also the, the name of the ambassador, extraordinary and plenipotentiary, you know. But that happened in the past because in the past there was no communication system. An ambassador have to decide everything uh, because uh, they cannot, you know, communicate with the head of state at that time. So that's why uh, you have to decide your own. But now everything is, is, is guided by the head of state, of course, the, uh, through the foreign minister. And then the uh, foreign minister and then will be uh, executed by all the ambassador and so on. So basically, uh, we are, because everything on, on certain, especially on, uh, on sensitive issues. Uh, uh, for example, when I'm, I was in Russia, for example, and there is a, a problem, or not a problem, really a problem, but there is a question from the uh, Russian side about certain issues, for example, about the uh, military uh, procurement, for example. Then I cannot decide myself. I have to send the uh, issue to the minister and then to uh, give us uh, the guidance. And, but on on some uh, you know unimportant issues, uh, the ambassador can decide. You know, like for example, when I decided to organize an uh, Indonesian festival, you know, uh, I just reported to Jakarta because uh, that's part of our job. So, so that's how it works, and uh, the world has become a global life. Uh, we cannot lie, you know, but uh, but it it is it is more difficult, I think, for the work of diplomat. Okay, thank you. Well, we have a question from Miss um, uh, Maria Yakovleva, and she is with us. Uh, uh, Maria, if you could please turn on your mic uh, and ask your question, that would be nice. Uh, I th I wanted to ask you to make it because it's not very convenient for me to do it now. Well. I will act instead of uh, Maria in this capacity. And actually, Maria's question is very good, uh, coupled with uh, two more. So I will group them in one, so to say, uh, policy-oriented uh, group of questions. Maria's question was about uh, what's your perspective, Sparkle Heat, on partnership in different spheres between BRICS member states and ASEAN? And uh, two more questions, which I think echo and uh, uh, complement, in a way, uh, Maria's question uh, is a question between uh, free trade area zone between Russia and ASEAN. Do you see any uh, opportunity for it to emerge anytime soon? And this is a question from our long-standing friend, Mr. Roman Novikov from the Foreign Languages Center in Myanmar. Who, so he's teaching Russian in Myanmar, has been teaching for quite a long time. And one more question to add here is from Mr. Andar Ezir. Nachin from also from high school of economics. Uh, do you see any uh, perspectives for cooperation, I assume, between Russia and ASEAN uh, in this sphere of sustainable development, attaining sustainable development aims? So to recap, BRICS and ASEAN, uh, Russia and ASEAN in the framework of free trade area, and generally sustainable development uh, Aims how we could uh, assess the opportunities for Russia and ASEAN within these multiple avenues. Uh, well, yeah, I think uh, BRICS is uh, like informal forum uh, between uh, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, uh, China, and what is what's in the S? Uh, Korea, yeah, uh, BRICS, yeah. Uh, well, so far there's not been any uh, cooperation between BRICS and ASEAN, but uh, I think any cooperation will be uh, will, will benefit both uh, because in some ways uh, there are uh, similarities in terms of the memberships. Uh, like ASEAN, uh, 
most of the ASEAN, ASEAN is much more diverse in terms of, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> the economy. Uh, one eco fun economy like uh, Singapore, but also uh, uh, middle uh, developed and less developed. But uh, ASEAN has been regarded as one of the most successful uh, uh, international organization, regional organization. Uh, BRICS is uh, the uh, grouping of more or less the same uh, uh, middle up develop, developing countries uh, with uh, have uh, you know many uh, common interests. So I think it is it, for me it's, it's a good thing if those two groupings uh, could work together. And then for FTA, so we in ASEAN uh, feel it very uh, important to have an FTA between ASEAN and Russia. Actually, uh, some negotiations have been uh, uh, held uh, several times. But in the meantime, uh, some uh, individual countries also uh, signed an FTA with Russia, like Vietnam, and the latest one was Singapore. And uh, Indonesia signed a memorandum of cooperation uh, uh, 2019 last year. So now, uh, uh, in the actually, we 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 propose to have a, a working group meeting, but because of the pandemic, it was held uh, through video conference. Uh, in the case with Indonesia, for example, uh, as I mentioned several times, uh, Indonesia and Russia is complementary. You know, we don't compete each other, but we complement each other. You know, like for example, we need uh, you know a lot of grain from, from Russia, military equipment and so on, machinery. But on the other way around, uh, Russia needs uh, from us uh, palm oil, you know, and other commodities like rubber and so on. Uh, so the problem, of course, uh, uh, because this is uh, a grouping, uh, uh, you know, it's not easy because uh, it, it, it's open only between two countries. It, it's much easier, but uh, the process is still going on. And then for uh, cooperation, the sustainable development, I think uh, I also supported this idea because uh, we have the uh, same problem uh, between Russia and Indonesia in terms of uneven distribution of wealth. You know, the Guinea index up between our two countries uh, are quite, uh, you know, uh, uh, quite high. Uh, so I think uh, it is a matter of uh, of time for us to work together uh, for the sustainable development because uh, there's been a target also from the United Nations and basically uh, we have a similar problem. Okay, uh, we have a number of, question, of questions popping up uh, right on the way. So uh, let us do it in the following order. Uh, Nikita Kuklin from Russian uh, University of People's Friendship University of Russia will be next. Then uh, Ksenia, Ms. Ksenia Yegorova, our frequent participant of all our SN academic days. And then uh, Ms. Valeria Vershinina from, uh, from SN Center uh, will be coming up with her questions. And then, uh, for for the final round, I have two more very interesting questions submitted by our pre-registered participants who unfortunately are not with us today. So, uh, Nikita, could you please unmute yourself and ask a question to Pakwe? Sure. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Jakarta time. Good morning, Hi. Moscow time. <laughs> How are you? Yeah, I very think glad I'm to see you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, dear colleagues, yeah. Uh, and I have a question concerning cultural uh, diplomacy. You're well known as a prominent supporter of cultural diplomacy and uh, cultural diplomacy is always connected with the image and the stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And what is the role of diplomacy in overwhelming these uh, stereotypes, especially in Indonesia? You know, some of the experts um, usually say that there is uh, a too hard to time stereotype about Russians. And also in Russia, we can observe a touristic country stereotype about Indonesia. <laughs> How to yeah. overwhelm this, overcome these stereotypes in diplomacy and in our uh, everyday life. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, uh, well, I believe that uh, cultural diplomacy is uh, the best way to connect between people. 
uh, you know, as you, you see the stereotyping of our two countries, you know, sometimes uh, quite uh, uh, unhelpful. So when we talk about culture, I think every every country they have their own wisdom, yeah, and we have to respect them. So the uh, key to the uh, cultural diplomacy is people to people contact, and the more people to people contact, I think the better. You know, uh, this is something that 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 I promoted from my first posting in uh, Australia and the United Arab and, and Russia and. And also, actually, the first festival was held in Melbourne at the time. Despite very, you know, difficult uh, relation between Indonesia and Australia, you know, we are we are neighbors, but we are too much different. You know, this is like Ambassador Sabam Siagan mentioned: Australia is a piece of the West in our neighbor. You know, and and with with different culture, we sometimes had very difficult time uh, because of the uh, the way the uh, Media in Australia portrayed about Indonesia and so on, and then that's why I uh, first actually organized the festival in Melbourne, and it was very successful. And uh, when we talk about the cultural diplomacy, we also talk about the economic diplomacy. Yeah. Look at what the Hollywood selling, you know, the Hollywood culture is. It's about uh, also economic diplomacy and about what about K-pop, J-pop, and so on. So I I will believe that. Once there is a cultural uh, contact link between countries, there'll be more understanding about, there will be more uh, respect about our own uh, culture. And that's for the good benefit. You know, after I organized the festival, the number of Russian visiting Indonesia uh, the, the, during the three, three years after the festival increased by almost 100%. But on the other way around, the Indonesian visiting Russia uh, increased by 600% from only 5,000 to 30,000. And Russia becoming one of the uh, favorite destinations for Indonesia. And even, which I did not you know, uh, predict in be be beforehand, uh, I found a group of you know, uh, Indonesians who went to Umrah, you know Umrah, they went to Hajj, to uh, Saudi. And then they always, they, and then some of them create like Umrah Plus. Usually in the past, they always go to, they always went to uh, Oman, to Abu Dhabi, to Benson. But recently, they went to Russia. Then, and then the places that they have to see, number one is Cathedral Mosque. Number two, Blue Mosque in St. Petersburg. There was history of Sukarno there. And then Kazan, yeah. Uh, so, so, I mean, I'm, I'm very, very, very optimistic about you know connecting people and now the interest between uh, people not only from the you know from the uh, education background but also you know the number of Indonesians also increased quite significantly. But from business side, uh, that's why I was happy to be uh, appointed as a representative of certain association business in Russia and and at the now that, that there are now uh, many. Uh, Indonesian businessmen also interested, you know, to do business in Indonesia. So, so it's multifaceted uh, diplomacy. Thank you so much, and thank you for thank you, Bhagwati, for your comment, and thanks. <laughs> thank you, my pleasure. And thanks, Nikita, for raising an important question because you know, uh, paradoxically, due to this COVID nineteen restrictions for international air flights, we are now rediscovering our own country. <laughs> And yeah, I, yeah. I can tell you frankly that, you know, visiting Kazan was uh, a kind of, um, well, a very strong uh, point in my personal life. And I think that it, it is equally interesting to, to other colleagues and friends and uh, specifically from those who will, I hope, come from Indonesia to, to meet Russia face to face. Um, we will now turn the screen to Ms. Ksenia Yegorova. She has a very important question. I mean, important to all of us. Ms. Ksenia, could you please turn on your mic and uh, pose your question? Uh, Salamat Sore, power hit. So mm -hmm. my question would be, under President Jokowi, the relations between Indonesia and China are flourishing people to people, government to government, people to culture to culture. What about Indonesia-Russia bilateral relations and uh, Jokowi's administration? Is Russia considered to be a strategic partner to Indonesia? Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, the uh, <clears throat> document about uh, strategic partnership already there. Uh, it is matter when 
our leaders meet, you know. Uh, and actually, uh, 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 President uh, Putin invited President Jokowi to attend the St. Petersburg Economic Forum, but we know because of the COVID, the forum was uh, postponed uh, until when, we don't know. And uh, during the meeting, it was scheduled that uh, both leaders uh, signed this strategic partnership. So this is the highest in, in our relation. I always mention that, you know, uh, the visit of President Jokowi to Sochi uh, 2016 uh, become the signal of the second golden era of our relationship because we had strong historical background uh, relationship with, with Russia. But I think uh, we have to admit under new order, uh, the relation was almost flat, you know? uh, no, not, not much movement at that but then, um, President Megawati visited uh, Russia and then also President SPY. And the last one was the visit by President Jokowi. We, we think that uh, Russia is very important to us. Uh, there are so many similarities between Indonesia and Russia, which people in the past uh, did not realize, like the multiculturalism of, of Russia. And uh, every time I met the uh, Russian uh, parliamentarian politician, they think that Indonesia is our true friend. And I think that is, that is true. You know? But of course, sometimes it's had to be admitted, sometimes not easy. Like for the example, the procurement of uh, Sukhoi, for example, we have pressure. You know? But uh, Indonesia is democracy now, so sometimes president cannot work by himself. You know? So I suggested that the vice minister, uh, Mr. Magulov, before I left that, uh, uh, why don't Russia give more scholarships to Indonesia? You know? Because now every year we had only 160, but compared to Vietnam, more than 1,000, for example. Because uh, the presence of uh, Russian graduates will uh, benefit uh, of our relations. Now even uh, there is a growing uh, interest from Indonesian uh, private students also who uh, study in, in, in Russia. This is new phenomenon actually, because uh, the quality is, is more or less the same with the Western standard, but but uh, studying in Russia is very cheap compared to uh, Western countries. Thank you, Pavel Hit. Thank you. Uh, let me now give the screen to Ms. Valeria Vershinina from SN Center in Gimur because she has reserved a couple of questions of her own. Please, Ms. Valeria. Thank you. Thank you, Paco Hit, once again for your great presentation. And I'm also looking forward for an English version of your book. I strongly believe that it will be very helpful for all of us and for young generation to, to know more about what it's like to be a diplomat and working in such different countries with such different uh, cultures. Uh, I have two questions, basically. And uh, the first one, we all see that uh, the social media and IT technologies are becoming a common thing for us. And um, we also can see um, talking about the uh, uh, foreign policy, uh, because I noticed that, for instance, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia today uh, using uh, social media platforms uh, to promote our for, foreign policy. For instance, they're using uh, such social medias as Facebook or Twitter or even Instagram. Uh, so my question is, uh, does the Indonesia Infa uh, use social media? Uh, and in which way, which way? And do you consider it as a useful tool? And the second question is more practical one. Uh, what advice can you give for young diplomats from Indonesia who will work in Russia, as well as for Russian diplomats who will work in Indonesia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Valeria. Uh, yes, we do the same. Uh, we use uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and so on. Uh, and not only the foreign ministry in the headquarters, but uh, the embassies also are required to do the social media because this is something that we cannot afford here. Yeah? And this is the cheapest way to uh, promote our interests. So I think most countries uh, do that. So this is something unavoidable. Yeah. We have sometimes also have to fight with social media because with the social media, everything is there and be the bet on the negative one. And we have to 
to counter sometimes. Uh, my always advice to young diplomat is before you are posted in certain country, please learn the history and the culture of the country. This is very important you know? uh, because uh, diplomat you know uh, is trained uh, to make relation closer with any country they are posted so if they don't like the history how could they make the relation closer so my advice always the same and i did it already you know as i wrote in the book so i tried to understand i tried to learn the uh, local culture and it worked well you know uh, in australia i was there for 11 years uh, sometimes very very difficult you know before before I go, I went to the office. I have to read at least three papers. You know. So first thing in the morning, my breakfast is newspaper, you know. because it's something wrong with the issue. And then once I come to the office, nine o'clock, the you know, journalist call me and ask about you know a certain thing. Uh, in Russia, it's much more relaxed you know, because the media in Russia is very friendly. You know, I, I, I and I've never got a very uh, critical question. Or sometimes, you know, in, in, in Australian standard, uh, sometimes the question is very provoking, you know. But here in, in Russia, uh, I enjoyed very much. I make a lot of uh, friends with the media. And basically, uh, they try to understand us as well before asking the question. You know. uh, I was surprised with the uh, holding of festival, for example. The media coverage is so huge in, in Russia. You know. Not not in in Australia. Uh, in Australia, uh, bad news is good news. <laughs> but but not in in Russia. They, they 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 love culture. That's why when we organize the festival, uh, the coverage is so huge. Not only the uh, uh, electronic media, but also uh, 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 in the uh, uh, printed media uh, as well as uh, internet media, online media. So. So this is my suggestion to any young diplomat. So my book is actually also uh, uh, addressed to uh, uh, younger diplomat. But actually, uh, not only for diplomat. You know, I, I used to learn about marketing, for example, in international marketing. It is very important to understand local culture. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, I would raise now. Uh, questions which are uh, interconnected with what Valeria already asks for. One uh, we received from Mr. Dafa Praditya from Indonesia, who is a vice president of SAMAN1 Karavang Student Council. And another one came from Mr. Nurtilek Kadyrov, a fresh graduate of Universitas Nigeri uh, Simarang. So, uh, Dr. Praditya asked, what would be your advice for younger generation about the global situation in, uh, the, well, from the political uh, point of view? And uh, Mr. Nurtilak Kadyrov asked a more, even more intricate question. So, he's wondering what is the difference, he wonders, what is the difference between diplomacy diplomatic and political aspect of an issue. So how could you dissociate them? And it really, if you, if you could do that. Um, so these are uh, two final questions, which I have from the pre-submitted uh, pre uh, list. And uh, I will now pass the screen to Pak Wahid. And meanwhile, if there are final comments or observations, please do let me know via the chat function. Pak uh, well, a very uh, general and broad question, uh, especially question number one about uh, you know global situation in polit uh, in politics uh, uh, and the advice for young generation. Well, every generation they have their own uh, characteristic. Yeah? Uh, I was when I was born and grown up, uh, there was no internet at the time now, but now. We belong to 4G generation, which is uh, of course different. The way we look at certain things is, is different. So my suggestion is, is, is that you know we cannot avoid any technology. You know. We have to learn. We have to follow the technology. Uh, it is you know like I remember a book written by uh, Francis Fukuyama, and the word is flat. You know. Uh, not even small, flat and smaller. You know because you know when when Francis Fukuyama 
uh, mentioned about the word is fat. So he's talking about you know about uh, laptop and uh, what do you call it the the, other, like, the, the similar like laptop. I can't remember the name. But not even uh, everything is on the you know on the mobile phone. <laughs> everything is there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the other aspect of the uh, internet uh, age is that everything is there, uh, and you have to be. Uh, conscious as well that not every information uh, in the internet is correct. You know? There are many hoaxes and so on. So, so you have to uh, take care of any issues and then you have to compare it and you have to check and recheck you know, whether this one is not correct. Sometimes, you know, uh, fighting could erupt, you know, with certain groups only because of the internet. So, so this is my suggestion. And second about uh, politics and diplomacy. Uh, politics is something very broad, yeah, very uh, you know, uh, large uh, concepts. It could be domestic politics, could be foreign politics. You know. But diplomacy, you know, if I look at the Britannica uh, uh, meaning, uh, is the uh, established method of influencing the decision on and behavior of foreign government and people through dialogue negotiation and other measures sort of sort of war file or violence. So the key is about negotiation and dialogue. So so if there is any uh, any problem within uh, two countries uh, on political terms, the way to solve it is through diplomacy. So actually diplomacy is part of the uh, politics in a global sense, uh, in broader sense. Thank you. So uh, we have spent quite uh, quite a while uh, interviewing Pak uh, on various issues and aspects which definitely go beyond uh, the book itself. But uh, well, you see that uh, our meeting has provoked uh, many um, streams uh, and avenues of uh, of thought and discussion. And generally, thanks for. Uh, letting us, reminding us again that uh, the cultural uh, aspect, the ethno-linguistic aspect, um, the historical aspect uh, of development is not less important that, than the political development and really politics cannot uh, exist without uh, this milieu which we uh, so often ignore. So at this point, uh, let me uh, express our deep gratitude to Pak Wahid for spending his time with us uh, and for reconnecting because in times like that uh, the the virtual environment uh, became a replacement for our physical context but let's hope that it will not last very long and we will be able to uh, reconnect and communicate once again in many different uh, aspects uh, apart from apart from zoom and virtual connections so uh please join me in thanking Pak Wahid and um we hope that this will be just one more uh, meeting not not the final one of course but uh one in the long long row of our talks and uh, and meetings thank you thank you thank you uh just my last words uh, thank you very much uh, dr Kavarina and uh, Sumsky at the Ten Center you know, for organizing this one. Uh, I'm sure this is not the last uh, one we uh, meet through virtual, but uh, should be offline someday because I try to bridge the interest uh, between uh, the two countries, especially now in business and also cultural aspects. So again, I thank you very much, Tasidanya. Uh, Terima kasih. 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 Ter